Let's open our Bibles to Mark chapter 13. This morning we're looking at the Great Tribulation. Warren Wiersbe tells a story about a man many years ago who loved the Lord, but he was mentally disabled. He was a little bit slow. He was challenged. He was a barber, but he was incredibly zealous for his faith, and he wanted to share his faith all the time. But this was back in the days when they used straight-edge razors. Well, this man, after he lathered a customer up, sharpened his straight-edge razor, and he approached the man, blade in hand, and he wanted to share his faith. And so he said, are you ready to meet your maker? (laughs) The man freaked out. He ran out into the street. He had lather all over the place. Shaving cream was flying. And uh, that man wasn't very successful. We're not always very successful when we preach to scare people into heaven. And yet, Jude tells us in chapter 1 of his epistle, verse 22 and 23, he says, on some have compassion, that'll make the difference. On others, save them with fear, pulling them out of the fire. And so there is a time and there is a place for hell, fire, and brimstone. And if there was ever such a time, it's when we look at the great tribulation. Read together with me. Mark chapter 13, verse 19. Jesus says, In those days there will be a tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the creation which God created, until this time nor ever shall be. This is one of our series in our end times messages that we speak about what is coming in the future. The big word we learned in Bible college was eschatology, and it simply means the study of last things. We've spoken about some of the elements that will be present when Jesus Christ returns again. Before he comes back, there will be, of course, a one world government. There will be a one world religion. There will be a singular charismatic leader who has signs of the miraculous. That will be the Antichrist. Israel will become a nation once again, which is an amazing thing, considering that they've been not a people for 2,000 years, and it's happened in the past 50 or 100 years. Another thing that will happen is the rapture of the church. That will spark what we believe will be the great tribulation. As Jesus speaks about it here in Mark chapter 13, verse 19. You can also look at Luke chapter 21 and Matthew chapter 24. This is a time of global catastrophe like no other. Imagination can't picture it. Special effects can't capture it. Computer models can't grasp what is coming to this planet. But the Bible lays it out and Jesus calls it the great tribulation because of its severity, its extent, and its ferocity. It's going to be worldwide, and practically nobody will escape. And yet, in Luke chapter 21, as we studied last week, there is a way of escape. When we looked at Luke chapter 21, Jesus told us that we could escape this dreadful time. Remember, he said, watch and pray that you may escape all of these things. Jesus Christ will take his church up, me and you, through the rapture, And turn his face back from the Gentiles to the Jews and focus again on the nation of Israel for a seven year period of time. That fig tree that we mentioned a few weeks ago. All believers in Jesus Christ will escape the tribulation, which is what we're going to look at this morning through the rapture. And those who will be left here on earth will have to endure. Notice in verse 13 of Mark 13, Jesus says at the end of that verse, but he who endures till the end, will be saved. There's either escape or endure. That's the only way to be saved through this time. You either escape through the rapture or you just endure through the heaviness of it. There will be some Gentiles, some non-Jews, who will turn to the Lord, probably very many of them, during this period when God pours out his wrath on the earth. But God, for the most part, will turn his attention back to the Jewish people, to his covenant people once again. And finally, this will be the last chance for the Jews. This is a period where God takes all of his attention and he focuses it on one people group, the Jews, his own people. When he came, these were his countrymen, according to the flesh, according to his blood. And so the Jews will turn back to Jesus Christ in this time, or Yeshua HaMashiach, their savior in that time. But it's a time of great trial. 
It's a time of great stress and anxiety. It's a time of tribulation. You can see the types in the Old Testament, how this is a time where God really focuses on his people. Remember when we went through Genesis. Remember Joseph, when he was betrayed by his brothers? And he becomes a type of their savior in a time of tribulation. There was a seven-year tribulation all over the world, but it was mild compared to the one that's coming. It was a famine. And Joseph had been sold out by his brothers, and, and he was sold to the Gentiles. They had traded him for pieces of silver, and he was sold into the land of Egypt, rejected by his brothers. They thought he was dead all those years. And then a time of tribulation came. A time of trial came where people were hungry. There was a famine. It was seven years long. And so they went down to Egypt and they faced a man that they thought was cruel and fierce. Lo and behold, it was their brother, Joseph. They thought he was dead all these years. They had sold him out to the Gentiles. And yet it's in that seven year period of tribulation that they recognized him once again. There Joseph revealed himself to them and he saved them. And so in the same way, during the great tribulation, the Jews will come back to Jesus. They'd rejected him, sold him off to the Gentiles for pieces of silver, as a matter of fact. They thought he was dead all these years, but he wasn't. He was alive. And like Joseph, he was raised up and seated at the right hand of God. Joseph was seated at the right hand of Pharaoh. But Jesus was raised and seated at the right hand of God. And there are the Jews in this time of stress and tribulation. The seven-year plague, they will come back to him, the true bread of life, and he will save them. Another example is Moses. They rejected him the first time, just as Joseph was rejected. And then in their time of slavery, they received Moses the second time. So the Jews will receive their Savior the second time. Remember we looked at Hosea chapter 5, verse 15 in a previous study where the Lord says there, I will return to my place until they acknowledge their offense. What offense was that? Well, it was rejecting him. Then they will seek my face, God says, in their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. The word affliction is very important. It's tsa'ar in Hebrew. And that's the word that's translated tribulation in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 30. Let me read it to you. When you are in tribulation, God says, and all these things come upon you in the latter days or in the last days, then you will return to the Lord and obey his voice and he will not forsake you or destroy you. And so in the latter days, in the time of tribulation, God says they will return to the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7 uses the same word, sa'ar. And it says, alas, that day is great. There is none like it. That's what Jesus said. There's no, no day like this day, this time, this tribulation. That day is great, Jeremiah says in verse 7 of chapter 30. There is none like it. It is the time of Jacob's trouble, sa'ar but he shall be saved out of it. If you look later on in the chapter, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 24, the answer is given to when will he save them out of it? It says in the latter days, in the last days. Daniel chapter nine, you might want to turn there. It's important to note that this seven year period is given specifically to the Jewish people. It will come upon the whole earth, but it's a time when God focuses on the Jews. In Daniel chapter nine, we've looked at what's known as the 70 weeks of Daniel. And the word week just means seven. It's 77s of Daniel, 490 years. And Daniel is told in chapter 9, verse 24, that 70 weeks or sevens are determined for your people, the Jews, and for your holy city. And then at the end of the verse, it says, this period of 70 weeks is given to seal up vision and prophecy. And so all of prophecy will be contained in these 70 weeks. And of course, that's a great study to look at how in the following verses, verses 25 and 26, God says, you know, you're going to know exactly when the Messiah comes, but it, because it will be 69 of those 77, 69 sevens, 483 years from the issuing of a decree until Messiah comes, 483 years to the day, and it actually happened, to the very day that Jesus came, 173,880 days. And Jesus came in, they, they thought triumphal entry, praise God, Jesus is going to take over. They were rejoicing, they thought it was the end. Jesus was weeping because he knew that he would be rejected. He was rejected, as it says here, verse 26, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. He will be cut off, and the people of the prince who is to come, 
the prince who is to come, which is the Antichrist. It says, now we come to the last week, the last seven. Notice verse 27. Then he, the Antichrist, will confirm or enforce a covenant with the many. That's a treaty with the majority. In democratic societies, all you need is a majority, 51%. I was in politics. That was an unfortunate uh, reality that I had to deal with. I was in the minority. But it says here that he will confirm, the Antichrist will enforce a treaty with the majority or the many for one week, one seven-year period. That is the tribulation. And so in the middle of that week, it says there, he will bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wing of abominations, or on a wing of the temple, you might understand that to mean, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation, or one who makes desolate until the end, that is decreed, is poured out on him. In other words, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, Paul the Apostle says, the Antichrist comes, he exalts himself above everything that is God, and he sits in his temple and he demands, he sits in the temple and demands to be worshipped as God. That is the middle of the tribulation period. Let's go back to Mark chapter 13. Because we can divide the great tribulation into two parts. The first half, three and a half years, and the second half, another three and a half years. And right in the middle of that is the... The abomination of desolation, that thing that's so abominable that causes God to pour out his wrath. And so in Mark chapter 13, we read that in the first half, it is it is a trial. It's rough, but it's not as bad as the second half. In the first half, you might you might mark it by three different words, deception, distress and disaster, deception religiously, distress politically and disaster ecologically. Notice verse six of Mark 13. It says, many will come in my name saying, I am he and will deceive many. There will be great deception in this period of tribulation, the first three and a half years. Notice in verse seven, the distress. But when you hear of wars and rumors of war, do not be troubled for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. That is distress. Luke talks about the distress of nation. There will be wars. And then in verse eight, it says there will be famines, and earthquakes in various places, and troubles. That is the disaster that we see globally, ecologically. Jesus says there at the end of verse 8, these are the beginnings of sorrows. And the word sorrow there is the word birth pang. That's a contraction. Now, we've had five children, and I found none of the birth pangs were a trouble whatsoever. But birth pangs are hard. They're very excruciating. And the thing about those troubles or those contractions is they come more readily and more powerfully. It's their frequency and it's their strength. And Jesus says these things will come in more rapid frequency and in stronger strength. That is, they will increase as birth pangs do. And so these are the first three and a half years of the tribulation. And one of the things that we'll look at, and we've looked at in the past, the the deception of the Antichrist. We've looked at the distress of some of the wars that will happen. And now the destruction ecologically, what's going on? Of course, we know that in the middle of this seven-year treaty, the Antichrist marches into his temple, the temple of Jerusalem, rather. And what Jesus says there in verse 14 of Mark 13, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, which we just looked at. Standing where it ought not, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Run. Jesus says, you just run into the wilderness because the tribulation is coming. In our verse, in in verse 19, there will be a tribulation such as not been. Well, what's it going to be like? Turn over to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6 verses, actually Revelation 6 to 18, give us a whole rundown. And so we're going to cover all of that this morning. Just kidding. Revelation 6 through 18, it's very easy to understand. God, this is the whole scene in heaven. John finds himself in heaven after speaking to the church of some of the things they need to correct. And then God sort of raptures him up into heaven. And he sees this vivid scene. All the angels are there, these amazing creatures. These The saints are there around the throne. And there sitting on the throne is God himself. And then an angel comes with a scroll. And the scroll is written on the inside and the outside. 
And every scholar and his brother tries to figure out what this scroll is. We don't know exactly. It may be God's will. It may be the title deed to the earth that God gave to Adam and Eve, but they gave away to Satan when they sinned. And so the earth has been in trouble ever since. And so the the question is, who can open this scroll? And nobody can. Who's worthy to open this? And John begins to weep because there's no redemption without opening this scroll. And he begins to weep and sob and convulse. And there an angel comes to him and says, don't weep. Because the Lamb of God is able to work. He's worthy and he's able to open the scroll. And so Jesus takes the scroll and he begins to open it. And with each seal being broken, you can imagine a scroll. And at the end, there are seven wax seals that you have to open those up. They didn't have envelopes in those days and and, uh, they didn't have books, but they had scrolls. And when a scroll was closed, it would be sealed with, with a wax seal. And so Jesus begins to break open these seals. And with every seal being broken, judgment is poured out. With the seventh seal, the last one, it actually opens up a whole new can of worms because then there are seven trumpets that are blown. And with each one of these trumpet blasts, a new judgment is poured out. And then with the final trumpet being blown, there are seven bowls of wrath poured out. Very simply put, the first seal is opened and a white horse goes riding out. It's a picture of the Antichrist. Remember, deception. In the first period, the Antichrist comes. And so it says there in Revelation chapter 6 that there is a white horse. We, we won't read it necessarily because uh, we'll move on very rapidly. The second horse is released with the second seal. It's a red horse. And that's a picture of war. Uh, Jesus said there would be uh, deception, the Antichrist. There would be distress, nations warring with one another. So the red horse goes out and there's war over the whole earth. The third horse goes, and it's a black horse, and it represents the famine that is to come. Of course, Jesus said that there would also be destruction, earthquakes, and famines. And so the first part of the tribulation, characterized by these things, the Antichrist comes. There's uh, some earthquakes that hit the earth afterwards with the fourth and the sixth seals. Verse 9, when he opened the fifth seal that I saw under the altar, the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God. And for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And then a white robe was given to each of them. And it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. These are those people who are killed in the time of the tribulation. And so the the third seal is broken. Then the fourth seal is broken. And, of course, you know that that's the fourth horseman, the four horsemen of the apocalypse we talk about. And he had death. It was just death. One quarter of the planet is destroyed. One quarter of the planet is killed. And that would be about 1.7 billion people right now. Could you imagine that? That happens in the first half of the tribulation. And that's not even the bad part. That's the early stages You might call the first half of the tribulation the tribulation and the second half the great tribulation because it gets much more fierce. God is now pouring his judgment out. But the fifth seal comes and it's not judgment, it's a reward for those hordes of people who are coming into heaven, who have trusted in the name of Jesus Christ and have been beheaded by the Antichrist or they've died in some of the disasters that are striking the world. Persecutions on the rise in the world today. Did you know that? We know of some of the early Roman persecutions. We hear about Christians being killed, but, you know, in our American insulation, we're really uh, unaware of the modern trend. In 2005, there were 171,000 Christians martyred for their faith in the world. Over 100 million Christians were martyred in the 20th century. That's from World Mission Digest. More Christians were martyred in the 20th century than all other 19th centuries combined. That's from a book called By Their Blood by James and Marty Hefley. And so persecution is on the rise. And in the tribulation period, it will be far worse. And then the sixth seal is opened. Verse 12 says, and I looked and he opened the sixth seal and there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth as hair and the moon became like blood. Stars of heaven fell to the earth like a fig dropping its late figs. And so there's a meteor shower. There's great earthquakes striking the earth. And then the seventh seal is broken. The seventh seal is broken. And we read in chapter 8, verse 1, an interesting verse. Chapter 8, verse 1. And then he opened the seventh seal. And there was silence in heaven for a half an hour. Now, some Bible scholars conjecture that this means women don't go in the rapture. I don't believe that. That's a joke, by the way. I don't believe that at all. I don't. 
hey, it's not my joke. I heard it from somebody else. The question is, where are my kids? Because they're not here. They're silence in heaven for a half an hour. The big question is, everybody wants to know, well, what is this silence? What is this silence? Well, Jesus just opened a scroll. For goodness sake, let God Almighty read it in peace. If you've got five kids at your house, you know you just want silence. Let me read for a half an hour, for goodness sake. So all heaven is silent. And then with the breaking open and the opening of this scroll, here comes seven trumpets. And the seven trumpets begin. And each of these angels begins to blow his trumpet. And each blast of the trumpet releases a new judgment on the earth, more potent than the earlier ones. The first one we read in chapter 8, verse 7, the first angel sounded, and all hail and fire followed or mingled with blood. They were thrown to the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. Consider that. One third of all the trees on the earth are burned up. It's an environmentalist's worst nightmare. It's not caused by man, though. It's caused by God. He sees fit to destroy one-third of every forest on the earth. And it says all green grass is burned up. Must have looked a little bit like it did in Exodus when the locusts came and they ate everything. Everything green. Every blade of grass was chewed and eaten. Every green thing, every leaf, every bush, every shrub completely burned up, it says here. It goes on, and the second trumpet is blown in chapter 8, verse 8. The second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. It seems like there's a progression here. With the first opening of those seals, there was one quarter of the population. Now there's one third of the population. It says here something like a great mountain burning with fire. It It kills one-third of all animals in the sea. It would probably just smell incredibly bad. It says one-third of the ships are either scrapped or they're sunk. We don't know exactly what it is. It looks like maybe a tsunami or something. Uh, Wipes out shipping on a large scale. In the 2004 earthquakes in the Ring of Fire down in the Indian Ocean, it was devastating, but it only killed 300,000 people only. That's that's dramatic. It's terrible. But it's not tribulation. It's just run-of-the-mill disasters, things that happen. We live through it. But if you go back five centuries, a thousand years, when they didn't report these things, who would have known what was happening in those times? Scientists, when they studied those waves, were amazed. Because of that earthquake, the tsunamis that wiped people out, they traveled all the way westward out of the Indian Ocean and they hit the east coast of Africa. As a matter of fact, the the fault lines carried the energy all the way 10,000 miles away and in Mexico, believe it or not, look at your map, see how far away that is, they had waves eight feet high. That thing rocked the world. Scientists say it actually stopped the world for three microseconds. Uh, Java was moved a hundred feet southward. That was pretty radical, but nothing like this. I mean, how, how could this happen? How could something destroy one third of all the animals in the sea? Well, it says there that a mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. They realized that tsunamis are one thing, but when an earthquake causes a tsunami, the maximum height of the wave is only about 30 feet. There's another kind of tsunami that's far more devastating, and they call them mega tsunamis. They're caused by rock falls or landslides. When an island is forming and part of that island crumbles in the ocean, huge chunks of rock, even mountains, can display so much water that a tsunami is generated that's far worse than one that's caused by an earthquake. When they've mapped the ocean floor around the Hawaiian Islands, they've found these massive chunks of our island that have fallen into the Pacific Ocean. They can't even imagine the size of wave that that would cause. They say it could cause a wave 1,000 feet high, 2,000 feet high. Nobody knows what it would look like. But there is a place just off the northern coast of Africa that causes geologists some concern. It's a place, it's an island called La Palma. It's about half as big as the island of Oahu. It's in the Canary Islands. It's the fifth largest island there. See, the island of La Palma causes concern because it has an active volcano on it. And this active volcano is called Cumbre Vieja. And it's punctured holes along the north-south axis that creates sort of a perforation of the island. 
The entire western side of the island is unstable. Back in 1949, there was, the volcano went off. And the whole western side of the island shifted. It began to sink into the ocean, and it went 10 feet. They were concerned because if that chunk of the island came off, it would cause such disaster, it would be incalculable. And so they went down into the earth to take a look. And they realized that the magma is actually heating the water which is soaked into the porous parts of the earth. And it's causing a separation where the middle of the island is being forced apart by steam and by heated water. Another eruption could cause the entire western half of the island to fall into the the Atlantic Ocean. It would be 500 billion tons of burning rock and it would come crashing into the ocean, generating a tsunami that we've never even imagined. How big would it be? Probably about 1,800 feet high. It would travel at 700 miles an hour toward the east coast of the United States. First Boston, then New York City, all the way down to Miami. They would literally be wiped off the map. A wave 2,000 feet. Now we go, yeah, I've seen that in a movie. Hey, just because somebody made a fictional story about it doesn't... See, we have this idea to think that can't happen. Why? Because in all of the 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years I've lived, I've never seen it. And so we think that because we've never seen it, it can't happen. Hey, it does happen. And nobody ever talks about it because they're all dead. People don't live to talk about this. This stuff is not reported and can't be reported. They find things. When Pompeii was buried, they found things. Nobody talked about it. Nobody wrote about it because it happened in a moment. Well, that could happen. It causes geologists to fear what could happen. And there's a lot of if, but those watching La Palma are not saying if, they're saying when. It may be. Just because we've never seen anything on this scale, And we tend to think it can't happen. The Bible says it will happen. It's going to happen. It's coming. It may be La Palma. I don't know. It might be California. Who knows? And so we read about the third angel. Things are getting pretty heavy in the tribulation. The third angel blows his trumpet. Verse 10. The third angel sounded. It says here, And a great star fell from heaven burning like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. And the name of the star is Wormwood or Absinthia. And it says there at verse 11, a third of the waters became Wormwood or bitterness, poison, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. And so here we read about something that looks like a meteor hitting the earth. There is a certain kind of meteor that is literally a a fireball. Like it says here, a great star fell from heaven burning like a torch. A meteor that's a fireball is called a bolide. And uh, when it flies into our atmosphere, it burns brightly. But before it hits the earth, it explodes into a million smaller shards of rock. They recorded a bolide over Tunguska, Russia in 1908 to show you the power of these things. This bolide exploded five miles above the Siberian forests with such a force that it leveled 80 million trees. It covered an area of 830 square miles, the size of Oahu. It was a thousand times more powerful than Hiroshima. And it was called, they actually refer to it as the Tunguska event. But the size of the bolide was 65 feet across. It's as big as this room. It was small. There are much larger bolides out there. As a matter of fact, one 20 times as big missed us just 10 years ago. Scientists saw it coming just a few days before it got here, and it barely missed. If it hit, it would have been the end of everything. Again, they make movies about this, and we're going to get Bruce Willis on a spaceship, and and he's going to blow it. No, it's not going to happen. It's so quick, it just doesn't happen. We're not going to stop it. They, They do say... There were some scientists over at the Pittsburgh University. They estimated that a 10-kilometer-wide bolide would explode with such force, it would be, listen, 100 billion times the force of Hiroshima. That would destroy the planet in about five minutes. But those things are out there. Anything smaller would cause massive upheavals of dust, worldwide blackouts, and they would pollute just about every body of water on the earth. It looks like from Revelation chapter 8, verse 10, that this star actually hits the earth and it pollutes one-third of the waters. If it hit the water, then we would have something completely different. So the Bible says that there's a bolide coming and it's going to hit the earth. We just don't know when. 
Scientists are looking. They're looking out. Astronomers are trying to track them, but they can't see everything. And so if this happened, of course, huge amounts of dust, plumes of pollution would, would emit from the earth. And the next thing that would happen is what we read in chapter 8, verse 12. It says, the fourth angel sounded and a third of the sun was struck and a third of the moon and a third of the stars and a third of them were darkened. In other words, you couldn't see them. It was dim for one third of the day, probably because of the massive amounts of dust in the air. Now, the fifth and sixth trumpets, you can read about them in chapter nine. A little difficult to understand. It seems that with the blowing of the fifth and sixth trumpets, hordes of demonic creatures are released. The first ones are like locusts. Uh, They can't kill you, but they make you want to die. You get stung by these and you want to die. Notice in verse 6 of chapter 9, it says, In those days men will seek death and they won't find it. They will desire to die, but death will flee from them. And so somehow or another they cannot die. I don't know how that works, but people are looking to live longer and longer every day. And who knows what's going to happen in the future. They might just get the right gene splicing and they can't die. They want to die, but they can't. I don't know how that's going to work, but that's the fifth trumpet. The sixth trumpet is blown, and another horde of these demonic creatures or armies are released. And the the language is very picturesque. I don't understand exactly what they are, to be honest with you. But what is clear is it says that they will kill one-third of the population. Notice in verse 18, it says, By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed. And so... Uh, something or other is is pretty radical. In the first release of judgments, one quarter of the planet is killed. Now, one third, another couple of billion people. It's just really incredible. Some people think that maybe when he describes these interesting creatures that are released and marching through the earth, that maybe he was getting an up-close microscopic view of certain bacteria or virus. Have you ever looked uh, at those pictures of dust mites? They look like these giant dinosaurs on the landscape, but really it's just a tiny dust mite on your hand. Have you seen those in National Geographic? I mean, they're really grotesque to think that there is this whole colony of bugs creeping and crawling over us right now. I mean, that's weird. But some people think that John saw uh, a, a microscopic image of viruses or or bacteria coming and destroying man through sickness. I don't know if that's true. I think you can go a little too far sometimes when interpreting things. Uh, But what we do know is that it kills one-third of mankind. But speaking of pestilence and speaking of disease, many of you know that less than 100 years ago, in 1918, the Spanish flu killed between 40 and 100 million people. They don't know the exact numbers because communication wasn't what it is today or wasn't uh, what it is right now. Uh, Some people have called the Spanish flu the greatest medical holocaust in history. What's taken AIDS 25 years to kill, the Spanish flu did in 25 weeks. 25 million people were dead within 25 weeks. One million people a week were dead in 1918. It was radical, and they called it a medical holocaust. But there is something that's even more pervasive and scary. It's called the bird flu. It's evolved to infect more species than any other flu virus. It's deadlier than any previously known flu virus stain. It continues to evolve, and it becomes more and more widespread and more deadly. It's led uh, avian flu expert Robert Webster to publish an article titled, and I think his title was trying to get across as much of his message as he wanted to say, listen to the title of Robert Webster's article. The world is teetering on the edge of a pandemic that could kill a large fraction of the human population. I don't need to read the article. I've read the title. But that appeared in The American Scientist. And in that article, Robert Webster said this. Listen, in 1997, the world came perilously close to a global epidemic of the flu. If this particular virus had attained the ability to spread from person to person, the pandemic might have taken the lives of one-third of the human population. As it was, only six people died. And all of them had contracted the virus from chickens sold in Hong Kong poultry markets. The only thing that saved us was the quick thinking of scientists who convinced health authorities to slaughter more than one million domesticated fowl in the city's markets. See, only six people died because they contracted it from chickens. The problem is if that flu virus 
becomes airborne and transmits from person to person. This guy says one third of mankind would have died. Now that's scary if you think about it. We don't think about it, do we? When was the last time you thought about the avian flu? Another thing that's alarming is the Center for Disease Control is warning about new resistant strains of bacteria. Did you know that staph, staphylococcus and strep, uh, those bacteria have become so resistant that over 2 million people are infected with them per year by the hospital. Hospitals can't even kill staph and strep. During unrelated visits, 2 million people a year in the United States are catching staph or strep throat. New strains of resistant diseases can be carried globally. They can be carried rapidly through air travel. You all saw this scare recently about that 31-year-old lawyer, Andrew Speaker. He traveled the globe with that extremely rare form of tuberculosis. You wonder, well, why did they make such a big fuss about that? Because it can kill millions of people. These guys know about this. This is what they study all the time. And so the problem is that when we travel... I mean, they even have a medicine, right? It's called airborne. Every time I take that stuff, I get sick. I don't know why. But when we travel, we carry diseases and sicknesses from one place to another. It looks like the more we travel, the more we meet other people, the more we visit other countries, the more we spread our disease. The bottom line is this. People make us sick. <laughs> Mutations and vacations are a deadly Combination, ingredients for pandemic. Listen to what the World Health Organization has said about this. We stand on the brink of a global crisis in infectious diseases. No country is safe from them. No country can any longer afford to ignore their threat. Now, with all of this, back to Revelation chapter 9. One third of the planet is wiped out. How? I don't know. It could be disease. could be pestilence. It could just be these demonic creatures chewing people up and spitting them out. Who knows? But it's coming, one-third. Notice verse 20, the reaction of those surviving. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols, gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Turn over to Revelation chapter 16. Six trumpets have been blown. The seventh trumpet is actually sounded in chapter 11, verse 15, but then there's an interlude for those of you looking to map out the book of Revelation. Chapters 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 speak about different things. There are uh, different sorts of things going on in this time. There's two witnesses in Jerusalem preaching the gospel. Uh, They're killed Their bodies are left in the street. The world celebrates. They decide to create another Christmas. They say, let's send presents back and forth because these two wretched preachers of Jesus Christ are dead. Let's celebrate. And their bodies lie in the street for about three days. Then they're resurrected and they ascend to heaven in sort of a post-rapture ascension. And then in chapter 12, there's the sign of the woman, Israel, running from Satan, that dragon. And she's being protected in the wilderness Uh, As Jesus said, when you see the abomination, flee into the wilderness. Uh, Chapter 13, we talk about the Antichrist and the false prophet and how they force the world to take the mark of the beast. And then in chapter 14, uh, after the world is taking the mark of the beast, God is sealing his own people, 144,000 Jewish men uh, who are virgins, who worship Jesus and they witness for him on the earth. And then with the breaking open of that seal, Chapter 11, verse 15 says this, I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. It seems that as we read in chapter 16, the the breaking or the, the trumpet, rather the last trumpet, the seventh trumpet, opens up the final judgments, the final seven bowls of wrath being poured out. We read in chapter 16, I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go pour your bowls of wrath. On the earth. And so the first went out and he poured his bowl on the earth. And a foul and loathsome sore. Uh, you can understand that to be pussing, to be festering, and sore is like a tumor. It came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So it looks like this mark that they took sort of becomes this loathsome sore, like a tumor. Kind of gives you satisfaction there. You go, ha ha, good for them. Um, anyway, verse 3 says, The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea. If you thought it was bad before this, look at this. And it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. 
It's one of the saddest verses in the Bible. I've got it highlighted. Every living creature in the sea died. And the things that God created, he loves them. They're amazing. I remember when I went spearfishing uh, years ago with my friend and, and, and just looking out in the vast blue ocean and, and seeing manta rays uh, feeding and just, just being in awe of God's creation. But now God destroys everything. There's no fish. Uh, there's no algae. There's no plankton. There's nothing. The trees have been burned up. There's no air to breathe, hardly. It's getting hotter. It stinks because every living creature in the sea has died. The next thing, verse 4, that the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water and they became blood. As a result of this, there is absolutely no drinking water left in the world. And I don't know if Coca-Cola is around to help out, but the angel from heaven begins to shout. You think, well, God, that's it's getting a little serious. These last judgments are pretty radical. Everything's dead in the sea. All the salt water is like blood, blood red. Maybe, I don't know what it is, but everything's dead. And now an angel pours out his bowl on the rivers and springs. That's our drinking water. And they become like blood and there's nothing to drink. So you think that's pretty heavy. And that's where the angel of the waters, after he pours out his bowl, notice verse 5, he turns and he says, you are righteous, O Lord. You'd almost think that somebody would say, Lord, that's unrighteous. That's not fair. But the angel there stands and in his firmness says, you're right and they're wrong. There's a tendency, to be honest with you, I'm a little tempted to think, well, this is kind of heavy. I don't know if I like a God of judgment like this, but this is God. In the New Testament, we read that God is love. In the Old Testament, we read in the Minor Prophets, God is wrath. And so there's a combination of his nature and his character. God is fierce in his wrath and his holiness. And here the angel, after he pollutes the whole earth, there's no drinking water, he turns and he says, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be or who is to come. Because you have judged these things, because they shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you've given them blood to drink. It is their just due. Paraphrase, they deserve it. They deserve it. We all deserve judgment. We deserve the wrath of God. Every single one of us deserves everything that's going to happen in this book. And the only reason that we escape it is by the blood of Jesus Christ. The only reason that I have access into heaven is because Jesus Christ died for my sins. I am worthy of this judgment. You are worthy of this judgment. Oh, thank God for his mercy. Why did he come to this earth to die for our sins? But it's incredibly almost ridiculously incomprehensible love for us. Why are we lovable? No. God is love and he protects us from his own wrath. It's pretty radical. The fourth angel, verse 8, it says, the fourth angel pours out his bowl on the sun and the power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat. Did they repent? No, they blasphemed the name of God who had power over these plagues and they did not repent and give him glory. Jesus said earlier in the the discourse from the Mount of Olives, he said that there would be signs in the sun. An interesting thing about the sun is that in the recent years, we've actually seen signs in the sun. We've learned that the sun's magnetic polarity switches every 11 years. Sun and the earth and all the planets, are they're like giant batteries or giant magnets. There's a a positive uh, end that positive charges is coming out of, and there's a negative end. And the sun's polarity reverses every 11 years. And this helps scientists to understand because at this switch, the, the north pole becomes the south pole. The planet doesn't flip over, but the magnetic charges within it reverse. And so every 11 years, the sun reverses its polarity. And the thing about that is, is that because it does that, some radical things happen on the planet or on the star. And incredible sunspots, storms, radioactive material hits the earth. Sunspots cause maybe your cell phone goes out. Well, it's probably because of the the increase in radioactive material blasting the earth because of what's going on in the sun. By the way, the sun will reverse polarity once again in 2012. It did it in 2001. It will reverse again in 2012. At that time, there will be increased danger 
of different diseases that you can get from the sun. It's important to, to be careful about that. But the thing is that this is what I find interesting is that the earth is also like that. But the earth very rarely switches polarity. We have a North Pole and a South Pole, like a giant battery. We have the plus on the top and the minus on the bottom. Our positive charges flow out from the North Pole and the negative charges flow out from the South. Maybe people in the Northern Hemisphere are happier because the positive charge is flowing out. I don't know. But scientists believe that the Earth's polarity switches. And I don't like their dates because they tend to date things very long. They say that the the polarity of the Earth switches every 500,000 years in part because the charge that we have, like a battery, decreases. And when it decreases, the earth can tend to wobble a little bit, like a top that's spinning. The energy is decreased. Uh, Things begin to happen. As a matter of fact, we have 60% less charge now than we did in Jesus' day. The polarity and the, the magnetism of the earth is actually weakening, leading scientists to believe that the time's coming when it will switch. That is, the North Pole will move or it will actually reverse. They don't know what's going to happen when that that actually occurs. But they say it happens every 500,000 years. And the last time it happened, according to them, was 700,000 years ago. In other words, according to scientists, we are 200,000 years overdue for a polarity shift. What happens with a polarity shift is that the magnetic field that we have, which blocks the radioactive waves coming from the sun, will go down, sort of like a, a computer powering down. It powers down and then it has to repower. And so the danger that many people believe, aside from the catastrophes that are going to hit the earth, uh, whether, it, you know, they say, well, the earth will slow in its movement. Maybe it'll speed up. I don't know. Maybe it'll stop. Maybe it will reverse. They, they just don't know. We don't know. But what they do know is that we have a magnetic shield around the earth that protects the earth from some of the rays that come from the sun. If the polarity of the earth shifts, the magnetic shield will collapse momentarily. Can you imagine that in your your mind? Let me make sound effects for you. It'll go, and then it'll start again. But what will happen is the sun's rays will be absolutely without barrier and they'll hit the earth. What will happen is exactly what it says here. The fourth angel poured his bowl in the sun and power was given him to scorch men on the earth. The radioactive waves that come from the sun actually stress our magnetic field. It's possible that in 2012, when the polarity of the sun shifts again, the increase in waves will cause our polarity to come under greater stress and shut down. If that happened, it would just be over. It would just be over. This giant blue ball that we live on would just be finished. The earthquakes would be so huge, you just couldn't even imagine. Read verse 17 with me of Revelation 16. The last bowl, this is it. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air. And a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne. This is Jesus. And he says, it is done. That's what he said on the cross, isn't it? It is finished. What was finished? Paying the price for you and me. What price? This price. He took all of this wrath upon himself. All of this judgment upon himself. And he paid the price. And when he was finished paying it, he said, it's finished. That is, you're bought. You're purchased. The price has been paid for you. Your ticket's purchased so you can get into heaven. You have free access into eternity and love and a relationship with God. And for those who don't receive that, they have to pay. And it says here that from the throne, he cries out saying, it is done. The judgment is poured out. Verse 18 says there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and such a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as has not occurred since men were on the earth. The great city was divided. Jerusalem is divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. Great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And then every island fled away. And the mountains were not found. And great hail from heaven fell upon men. Each hailstone weighed the weight of a talent. It's between 50 and 100 pounds. When I'm at the gym, I see those 45-pound plates. And uh, that's about the size of one of these hailstones. You couldn't even hide from that, could you? I mean, if they're coming down from heaven, it's so incredible. And it says men, uh, this is amazing to me at, at the end of verse 21, men blasphemed God because of the plague of hail. 
since that plague was exceedingly great. Here they are blaspheming God. You know, the Bible says it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. You know, we say, if, if you don't repent under God's kindness, you won't repent under his wrath. You know, in this period, this window of opportunity that we have grace from God to repent, well, we should repent. Well, I'll repent when times get tough. No, you won't. You think you will, but you won't. These people here are the people that said, I'll repent when times get tough. They're right here. And they curse God. They blaspheme God. And they, they, I mean, with their fists toward heaven. So incredible. It's the biggest earthquake that's ever hit the earth. Isaiah chapter 24, verse 19 and 20 says this. The earth is totally broken and split open. The earth is violently shaken and it will reel back and forth like a drunk. And it wobbles like a shack. It will fall and not rise again. We read here in our text in Revelation that the cities of the nations fell. You read that in verse 19? What does that mean? It means exactly what it says. The cities will fall. There will be no buildings. I think probably it's true, as Jesus said, of the temple, not one stone will be left on another. A little similar here. Not one stone left on another. There won't be a single building in the world. Well, it says also the mountains were not found. It's as if God takes this planet like a a beach ball or like a, a volleyball and he shakes it himself so that even the highest mountain peaks are like sand dunes that just get shaken and, 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 and measured down to nothing. They're flattened. There are no more mountains on the earth. You can't even fathom what that's like. And then it says there that every island fled away with continents crashing. Mountains crumbling, ice caps melting from these heat coming in from the sun. There will be no islands left, no Hawaii. The islands fled away. There will be no electricity. There will be no cell phones. There will be no email. There will be no cars. There will be no trade. There will be no commerce. There will be no newspapers. There will be nothing. Some people will survive. The question is, are you ready for this? I want to escape. I don't want to endure. I want to escape. The Bible says that mankind will be as rare as gold on the earth. You can't find them. There might be a few people that survive through this. Five, ten, maybe fifty. I don't know how many, but not that many. Are you ready for it? Well, if you haven't turned your life over to Jesus Christ, you're not ready. One thing about all this, the wrath of God that we learn very loud and clear is that there are two things true in this universe. Number one, there is a God. And number two, you're not him. God is God and we are not. I'm going to close with this. The scripture says that in the last days, knowledge will increase. It's true. Knowledge has increased. Sometimes I think we take too literally that axiom that says knowledge is power. We think we're empowered because we know a lot when the reality is we're not. But knowledge will increase in the last days and information is exploding. A week's worth of the New York Times has more information in it than a person in the 18th century would have come across in his whole lifetime. One week. Every day, 3,000 new books are published. Did you know the number of text messages sent and received every day exceeds the population of the planet? Thank you, teenagers. Hey, what comes after a gigabyte? terabyte what comes after a terabyte petabyte what comes after a petabyte an exabyte an exabyte is a huge it's a billion gigs of information all the words ever spoken by human beings on the planet throughout our history would result in five exabytes of information try to wrap your brain around that All the words ever spoken by all people throughout all of human history could could be contained within five exabytes of information. But this year alone, one and a half exabytes of unique new information will be generated by humankind. That's more than the past 5,000 years combined, and it's over 10 times the amount of all printed materials universally which is 200 terabytes for your information, printed material. Last year, 47 million laptops were shipped 
worldwide. By 2013, just a few years from now, computers will exceed the capacity of the human brain. Fifteen years from now, you'll be able to buy a computer for $1,000 that exceeds the capabilities of your own brain. Within 40 years, it's estimated that computers will be made that can exceed the computational capabilities of the entire human race. They'll be able to put all the brain power of every person in the world into one computer. And you know what that'll be to some people? God. That will be God. Humanism completed. All of our minds working together for whatever I want. Knowledge is increasing so rapidly in the world, but information is nothing without the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God is so much more important than possessing data. And that's why God says in the Old Testament, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he knows me. In the busyness of this world, in the chaos that's coming, it's so important that we cling on to and hold on to the only hope, the true hope that we have in Jesus Christ. 